and welcome to the season opener of the 2019 All Wheel Drive Club Ravenel Brit Park Safari Competition. The first round season is here in the Welsh Valleys at Walters Arena, where we left off in 2018. Now, for the first event, we've got over 60 competitors, so you should be treated to something special. However, before we get into the action, let's hear from one of our sponsors. Talk us through, tell us about your involvement here and why you've chosen the All Wheel Drive Club. It epitomises uh, clubman motorsport, which is what we're really into. Uh, at the moment, I think as a company, we cover virtually every discipline uh, of motorsport, from karting through to off-road racing, rallying, we're sponsoring the Welsh and the Scottish Championships. I was amazed, actually, that so many people were already here uh, and struggling to unload their cars in um, a climate that you can hardly stand up in. I mean, Walters is renowned for inclement weather, but this is probably some of the worst I've ever seen, apart from snow. Uh, we've got horizontal rain, gale force winds, and everyone's just out there getting on with it. And that really, again, I used the word epitomise earlier on, it epitomises clubman sport. Well, thankfully, conditions improved significantly overnight, and it was a chilly but dry morning that greeted the crews as the competition began. Setting the early pace was Adrian Marfell, who clocked fastest times on both of the first two runs of the day. He was quickest by eight seconds on run one and a remarkable 23 seconds up on the competition during the second run, despite the odd moment over some of the rougher terrain. Stephen Hiat was second after the morning's first two passes and the only driver who could really keep pace with the early leader. He was still over half a minute behind though and hoping for more speed in the following runs. His pace through the high speed sections was mightily impressive though and he'll be looking to use that to mount a challenge for the lead later on. Paul Rollins was keeping Hiat in his sights though, he was only 11 seconds behind after the first two runs of the day. Paul was actually quicker than Stephen in the second pass, setting the second fastest time of the day so far. If he could continue that pace for the rest of the day, he could yet be a contender for the victory. Paul's son, Jason Rowlands, ignited the family rivalry straight away. Only one second slower than his father in run one, he ended the first two runs in fourth place, just seven seconds behind in the early fight for both the class lead and an overall podium. It was full commitment for Jason, and it'll be fascinating to see who comes out on top. Kevin Stubbs had a mixed morning at Walters Arena. The quickest in the first run was a promising start, but he was eight seconds slower on his second attempt, and one of few drivers not to improve, dropping him to seventh place. He was still second in class though, not by much. Mark Hones also lost positions between the first two runs, despite improving his time across the morning. He was the second fastest Class 8 car behind overall leader Marfell after run one, but had dropped to third after run two and eighth overall. A mini perhaps struggling a tired on the tighter sections of road. Justin Brooks, on the other hand, was climbing up the leaderboard. A one position gain between the first two runs from 8th to 7th may not sound too impressive, but he improved his time by 23 seconds between runs 1 and 2. This improvement in pace puts him third in class 5, but now only 7 seconds behind the top 5 overall. as Justin's improvement was, it was nothing compared to that of Ron Parker, 
A lowly eighth after his first run, Rod improved by 30 seconds on his next one to leap into fifth outright and second in class eight. He is currently at the head of a very tight battle for that fifth place though, and will have to work hard to keep it. contender Mark Jakes had a solid start to the event and sits ninth overall after the morning's action. He's third in class nine at the moment but only by four seconds in what promises to be a battle that rages throughout the day. Peter Roberts set identical times on his first two runs and rounded out the top ten in the early stages. Consistency will be key on this event and not easy to achieve as the route will no doubt get more and more rutted and churned up as the day goes on. Hot on Peter's heels is William Stubbs, another driver who is set to be very much part of the Class 9 podium battle. It was a sometimes cautious start for William, who improved his time steadily throughout the morning. Fifth in class after two runs is a solid start, but he'll be hoping to move up the leaderboard as the event goes on. A veteran of off road racing, having competed for over 10 years, and understands that sometimes, in the early stages at least, slow and steady can win the race. Chris Cumming was hoping to be contending for a Class 5 podium this weekend. He sits fourth in class after the morning's first two runs and less than 20 seconds off the top three, so that's definitely still the realistic target. In one of the shortest wheelbase vehicles in the event, the bumpy sections were providing Chris with a rough ride and us with some spectacular viewing. short wheelbase though should give him an advantage through the more technical sections, even if it is a little lively at high speed. Fifth place in class nine early on was Gareth Edwards. He improved by 30 seconds between the first two runs but he's only four seconds clear of his nearest class rivals. Class 9 is one of the best supported classes in the event, with 15 starters, so tight competition was always expected, with several contenders for the podium places. Richard Wynne Williams was one of those potential podium finishers, but early dramas would put paid to any chance of a good result. He dropped nearly two minutes as the class leader in the first run, before eventually being forced into retirement. Not the ideal start to the season, and definitely a missed opportunity on an event that Richard should have been competitive on. Andy Dare was another driver to retire early on in the event. Class 5 competitor was the quickest in class in run 1, but didn't make it to the end of the morning. In 
enjoying slightly better fortune was Mike Bakewell, who sits seventh in Class 9 after two runs, but has at least managed to stay out of trouble early on. Less than 40 seconds currently separate third through to seventh in Class 9, emphasising just how competitive a class it is. Mike will be looking, no doubt, to move into the top five before the end of the day, and only has to find 14 seconds to do so. Mike was second in the championship last year, though, so more pace is definitely likely to come as the event goes on. Scone was one of the biggest early improvers, finding an extra 46 seconds between his first two runs. Rob is another Class 9 contender, and is only four seconds away from the top five in class. He's also one of the most spectacular drivers out there, bouncing his way through the course in entertaining fashion. Martin James was someone tipped to challenge for a Class A podium, but was another driver who failed to survive the morning's action in one piece. Martin looked to be on the pace before his issues, but his true potential on this event was never fully realised. back to Walters Arena and the opening round of the All-Wheel Drive Club Safari Championship. Before we continue our rundown of the order, let's check in with a few of the drivers to hit trouble early on, starting with Richard Mayer Barron. After a solid start to his first run of the day, disaster struck and Richard was unable to complete the opening run after damaging the car over a particularly rough section of the course. Subsequent damage left him with little to no steering and led to him nearly running over our cameraman. After briefly blocking the route, Richard was eventually towed out of harm's way. Ryan Cook was one of the pre-event favourites to run right at the sharp end, but unfortunately was yet another driver to hit early trouble and failed to make it through the morning's runs. Ryan was one of only two entrants in Class 2, so a class victory was definitely on the cards. However, the cross-country competition veteran ran into early drama and his event never really got started. A retirement after two runs was the end of his day. Class 6 lost a couple of contenders early on, including Leighton Dodds in car number 11. Simon Adams was setting some competitive times through the middle of the day, but unfortunately was forced to retire after the fourth run of the event. His spectacular Lotus XE styled machine looked and sounded fantastic whilst it lasted though, so he is hoping he's back again later in the year to show us exactly what it's capable of.
On to the third run of the day now, and another car moving into contention for a podium place in Class 5. Dylan Parpota set his personal best time on the third run of the day, moving into fifth place in class and now less than a minute away from the podium positions. Jason Rowlands may be enjoying a healthy lead in the class at the moment, but behind him things are getting tighter and tighter, with still half the event left to run. improved pace is particularly impressive, now running 30 seconds quicker than he was at the start of the day. As expected, Andy Powell was setting some of the fastest times of the day, when his Cosworth-powered Peugeot was working properly. Former runner-up in the BCCC was plagued by issues all day long, during a sluggish start to the event, but picking up the pace through the middle of the day. Unfortunately, he would face retirement with just two runs still to go, but he's definitely a driver who could compete for victories this year, if we see him back again. Peter and Henry Crudge were enjoying a fairly lonely event, they were over a minute behind anyone else in Class 9 by the midday point, and over two minutes ahead of anyone else in Class. This didn't mean they were taking things too easy though, and they were still enjoying the slightly drier conditions as the day went on. Comfortable margin, though, did mean that they could take things a little more carefully through some of the rougher sections of the course. Ian Parry was also having a fairly quiet event, some way off the pace of the leading contenders in Class 8, but staying out of trouble and enjoying himself nonetheless. car did seem to be a little jittery over some of the bigger bumps on the course, perhaps leading to a slightly more cautious driving style. For Ian, the goal is simple, stay out of trouble and reach the end in one piece, a task that so far he's managing perfectly well. Leading class six at the midway point is Dale Gilbertson. Dale has improved significantly as the day has gone on and now holds over a one minute advantage in class. However, Dale knows that one slip up could see that class lead evaporate, so he'll be looking to balance risk versus reward as the conditions on this route change throughout the day. Stuart Williams made it to the halfway point, but no further in the event. Unfortunately, the number 16 machine was out by midday, having never really been able to show its true potential. Stuart was one of several Class 5 cars already out of the event, in what was turning into a day of attrition, not just for that class, but the entire field.
It's easy to see why people were falling by the wayside. The route was getting more and more challenging with each passing car. So easy to break the suspension on some of these really vicious bumps. Second in Class 6 and chasing Dale Gilbertson was Scott Benwell. Scott was actually quicker than Dale in the opening run of the day, but slower in the following two, meaning that he trails by nearly a minute at the midway point. Despite this, he still enjoys nearly a minute and a half advantage over the rest of Class 6, so a class podium is looking almost inevitable, providing he stays out of trouble. Class 4 is being dominated by Lewis Simon. However, second place at the wheel of number 78 is Di Paul Hansen. Hansen is five minutes behind the class leader at the halfway point, but only 40 seconds clear of his competition in second place. So defending that position is fast becoming his priority moving into the afternoon. With only three entrants in class four, a solid finish will guarantee a podium result for Hansen he'll be aiming to be as high up that podium order as possible. It was not a great start to the season for Keith Wilde. The Class A competitor was struggling for pace all day and unfortunately would retire from the event just before the start of his final run. Lizzie Jones may be languishing down in 8th place in Class 9, but has improved the times by nearly a minute since the start of the day. That's particularly impressive given the worsening road conditions and demonstrates just how much the confidence is improving inside the number 14 machine as the event goes on. Lizzie is only 20 seconds clear of the nearest Class 9 competitor though, so there's still plenty worth fighting for over the remaining three stages of the day. Bruce Mallet is Lizzie's nearest rival, and at only 20 seconds behind, it's still well worth pushing on to try and pick up that extra position. Bruce was quicker than Lizzie in the first room of the day, and despite steadily improving his times as the day has gone on, he hasn't been able to beat the number 14 machine since. Still, he's in the top 10 in class, and as others start to drop by the wayside, there's every chance that he could start to move further up the Class 9 leaderboard. So, as long as he stays out of trouble, there could still be a decent result on the cards. Bruce will no doubt be one of several drivers looking to improve their pace in the afternoon runs. The drivers will now be much more familiar with the course, but the conditions of that course are deteriorating all the time. It's going to be a fascinating afternoon's running to see how the final positions work out. Hello and welcome back to the All Wheel Drive Club Safari Championship here at Walters Arena in sunny South Wales. Adrian Marfell is still your event leader as we head into the afternoon's action, now nearly 45 seconds clear at the head of the field. 
In second place is still Stephen Hiat. He still leads in class nine. He may be three quarters of a minute off the event lead, but on the third run through, he was only four seconds slower than Marfell. He's still pushing on in the hope that he can apply the pressure to the leader. He is the class leader though, by over a minute now from Kevin Stubbs, who's second place in class nine. Jason Rollins is still third overall, and as the leader of class five, it means that there are three different classes represented in the right between positions. He too is about 45 seconds behind Heert, and about 45 seconds ahead of Kevin Stubbs behind him. Fairly tight though, any mistakes could see some significant changes at the front of the field. A few more drivers have fallen by the wayside though, including Mike Arthur, one of the five Class 1 entrants here this weekend. Class 1 is for the more production-based machines, which are unsurprisingly struggling to cope with the tricky terrain. Roger Baker has also been eliminated, managing just two runs before his Class 6 Land Rover fell by the wayside. It's a shame because he was part of what was an increasingly competitive battle for the podium positions in Class 6, but his first event of the season comes to an early end. Keith Wilde's day is done as well, getting within one run of the finish, but unfortunately hitting late dramas, meaning that he will have to watch the end of the event from the sidelines. Back to the Class 6 battle now, and in third place, appropriate enough in car number 6, is Daniel Hardy. Daryl is currently a minute and a half away from the top two in class and even further ahead of anybody else, so a third place finish looks to be the best that he can hope to achieve at the moment. However, it's still a solid start to his championship campaign, and if either of the top two fall by the wayside, he'll be there to pick up the pieces. Jasmine Philpot is currently the last of the Class 8 runners still running. However, she is targeting consistency over outright pace this year. Jasmine is a fairly experienced competitor in the championship, one of the fastest female contenders that we have currently in the AWDC. She's formally finished top 10 in the championship outright and is looking to try and replicate that in 2019. It's not been an untroubled start for Jasmine though, and she'll be hoping her fortune and pace can improve as the year goes on. On to class seven now, and Jason and Harry Nickel, who at the halfway point of the event are running second in class. The pair are currently about 30 seconds off the class lead, but have been running comparable times throughout the morning's runs. They'll be looking to try and improve on that to challenge for the lead in the afternoon. Class 7 may only have two entrants this weekend, but it's fast turning into one of the most competitive classes out there. In Class 4, meanwhile, Lewis Simon still enjoys a very healthy lead. However, it's not just his class position that is impressing, but his overall times are troubling some of the top 15 runners. If he can keep this consistent pace up throughout the rest of the day, he could move into the top 20 overall, which is particularly impressive for a class four car. He's been learning when to push and when to take it easy, but so far, he's found magic balance. In 
Class 5, it's fair to say it hasn't been a brilliant day so far for James Bull. This usually very competitive Yamaha has been played with issues all morning, keeping him from setting the competitive times that we would have expected to see. He's currently the lowest of the Class 5 cars still classified, and over a minute behind Lewis Simon, the Class 4 leader, so even a positional change is looking unlikely. For James, this now becomes a glorified test session to try and iron out the kinks and look for better results later in the year. Next in the overall classification are our Class 1 leaders, Philippa and James Tennant, in their discovery. The Tennant pairing are three minutes clear in Class 1, the more production-based class, and are troubling some much more powerful machinery. An altogether very impressive run, despite one or two hairy moments. The name of the game in a more production-based car is to stay out of trouble. These things simply aren't designed to deal with such rough going. Slow and steady is definitely the order of the day. And keeping the car undamaged is vital. The fight for second in Class 4 is heating up as well, with Dipole Hansen now only 20 seconds clear of Andrew Wartz for second place in Class. Andrew has taken significant chunks of time out of Hansen across the middle of the day and he's really starting to reel in the second place map. The chance of a class victory seems to be out of the window for both of them, but it's a very hotly contested fight for the lower steps on the podium. Next up is the man second in Class 1, Ian Gwillem. Ian is about a minute clear in second place in the class and doesn't seem to have much hope of catching the tenants out in front, so you can understand his steady approach to the afternoon's runs. Class 1 has seen a remarkably low attrition rate though, and is a great demonstration of an affordable way to get into off-road racing. These cars require relatively little modification, and you can pick up a donor car for remarkably small amounts of money. Well worth it if you're interested in getting involved in the sport. Ryan Cook's early demise, that leaves Chris Brennan as the only remaining Class 2 runner still in the event. Understandably, Chris hasn't been taking too many risks. The Class victory is in the bag, he just needs to bring the car home in one piece. It is, though, a very, very recognisable car, brightening up the sometimes dim and gloomy Welsh forests with its bright colour schemes. Like us, Chris will no doubt be hoping we get a few more Class 2 competitors as the year goes on, so that he has some slightly stiffer competition. Nonetheless, he'll have been enjoying his days off-roading here at Walters Arena, one of the most famous events in the AWDC calendar. If it 
hadn't been for dramas on the opening run of the day, we may well have been talking about Alec Fern as a potential Class 6 winner. His times throughout the middle portion of the day have been every bit as quick as class leader Dale Gilbertson, but a 28-minute time on the first run of the day saw him lose about 14 minutes on the rest of his class rivals. A disappointing start to the season, pace is clearly there, and hopefully we'll see him deliver on that throughout the year. Another driver to put into that category is undoubtedly Rob Scone, who was setting quick times until having to take the bogey time of 28 minutes in the third run of the day. Before that point, Rob had been setting times that would have comfortably put him in the top five in Class 9 and the top ten overall. Another case of missed opportunity, but he'll be hoping to bounce back in round two. in the overall fight for a good position, but Rob is still putting on a show and pushing to the limit. Like his Class 6 rival Alec Fern, Derek Wheeler also took a bogey time for failing to complete the opening run of the day. However, unlike Alec, his times have not been quite as competitive since that point. Clearly some issues still underlying with the number 34 machine. Derek will be looking to try and iron out whatever the issues are so that he can improve his pace later on in the season. He's currently the last of the Class 6 cars still running in the event. Whilst for Derek, the final few stages are all about survival, front of the field, there are fights for the podium still to be decided. Be sure to join us after the break for the conclusion of the opening round of the championship here at Walters Arena. Welcome back to Walters Arena where we're moving into the final stages of the first round for the All-Wheel Drive Club Safari Championship. One or two more drivers though unfortunately have failed to reach the finish including Victoria Vaughan who made it all the way to the fifth run but unfortunately will not make it to the end. Victoria though did provide us with this unique onboard footage so it would only be right of us to show you a unique perspective of the Walters Arena route. Victoria, she'll be looking for better things in round two in a few weeks' time. Also in strife towards the end of the event, at the wheel of number 96 was Win Williams. Win Williams made it just into the second half of the day, and in fact his final run on stage four was a very competitive one, third quickest overall. Unfortunately, reliability is still an issue. He'll be hoping to work on that throughout the rest of the season. If he can, he's a definite contender for victories. Richard Wynne Williams would also fail to finish, unfortunately, making it as far as the fourth run before calling it a day with mechanical issues. To the leaders then with just one more run to go. It's Adrian Marthel who continues to extend his margin at the head of the field. Now over a minute and a half clear of this man, Stephen Piat, in second position. Stephen though is still leading class nine, but it's very close behind him. William and Kevin Stubb, second and third in class nine, third and fourth overall. And William, he may be over a minute away from third, second place overall in the standings, but he is only about 20 seconds or so ahead of Kevin Stubbs, the wheel of car number 72, for the second spot in Class 9 and the third step of the outright podium. So there are still places that could change towards the very front of the field. Jason Rollins is still leading in Class 5. His advantage, though, is only six seconds going into the final run of the day. He was enjoying, earlier on, a fight with his father. Now Jason has established himself as the quicker of the two Rollins, but is more focused on trying to take the Class victory. Justin Brooks, though, is applying an awful lot of pressure to him. Going into the final stage, it could go either way. Justin's tyres have been improving all day long. He's now one of the fastest cars out in Walters Arena. 
is it going to be enough for him to move into fifth place overall and the victory take the victory in class five? Well, only time will tell. With one more run to go. He's going right down to the wire. Rod Parker is next up. He's leading class eight slightly more comfortably. For him, it's just a case of getting to the end untroubled. He's not likely to trouble the class five cars in front of him. He's got Chris Cumming not a million miles behind him, but again, he's in class five too. So for Rod, he just needs to stay out of trouble for the final run. Speaking of Chris Cumming, third place in Class 5 appears to be going his way. He's still pushing on, though, towards the end of the day, and he's setting some of the fastest Class 5 times out there. He's still as spectacular as ever over the bumps. Chris has been steadily improving all day long, and he's comfortably in that third place. If he wanted to, he could afford to back off from the final run. I somehow don't think he will. Mark Jakes, meanwhile, is fourth in Class 9 with one run to go and is just two seconds clear of Mike Bakewell, who is also in Class 9. That's another battle at the back end of the top ten that will go right down to the flag. Some more late retirements, though, unfortunately. Matthew Hall, after some earlier dramas, had been starting to up the pace through the middle of the day. But stage 5 was his last and the Treble 4 machine will not make the finish. Meanwhile, we're hearing there may well be another late drama, and unbelievably, it involves the event leader. Anthony has more. Adrian is going all so well up until that last run. Uh, talk us through it. Uh, yeah, well, I suppose that's motorsport. We've uh, just broken a wheel now on the last lap. Um, yeah, we hit, hit the, a big, big rocker come out. We didn't see it. Just hit the, hit the, hit the wheel, and uh, I think it's broken the wheel pretty much straight away. So we were fighting to get back round. Wheels left on about three spokes so uh, we've uh, pulled up and tried not to do any more damage so yeah disappointing but there we are that's the way it goes well remarkable late turn of events there with the event long leader adrian marfell out of the running that means that stephen hiat takes over the lead of the event by less than 15 seconds though going into the final run of the day this is fantastic stuff kevin stubbs will move through into second position but stephen hiat doing everything he can to hold on through the final run Kevin Stubbs is looking good for second place in Class 9 regardless, but he'll be pushing on to try and close in on the event leader. Second place, though, would be a pleasant surprise for him. And Jason Rowlands looks like he's going to come home the Class 5 winner, but by a fairly slender margin over Justin Brooks behind him. It's been a really, really close one between the two of them. Mike Bakewell will come home inside the top 10. In Class 9, he will be the fifth highest finisher. Again, a solid run this for Mark Bakewell. He's not quite going to catch Mark Jakes, though, I don't think. Mark looks like he's going quicker on the final run of the day, and that should be enough for him to hang on to fourth place in Class. in class eight it's the mini of mark holmes that's going to come home second in class rod parker looking good for the class victory mark was never really in touch with rod but will be happy with the podium finish and he's kept ian parry at bay as well throughout the second half of the event so a good solid start to the season for mark gareth edwards will come home sixth place in class nine Another fairly uneventful opening round for him just what he wanted though to start off his 2019 campaign
Well, down towards the end of his event, the opening round of the championship will come Peter Crudge, and he is going to round out the top 10. He will also be in the top six in class nine too. One of the lower class nine runners at the end of the event. But still glad to see him reach the finish in one piece and gaining valuable experience for later in the year. Phil and Parpatos will be fourth in class five at the end of the, of the event. And he had a fairly solid run. No real dramas over the course of the six runs. Kept it clean, kept it in one piece. A podium in class five surely beckons before long. Harry is next up. The number three car will come home third in class eight. A podium finish for him on the opening round of the championship. Some good championship points as well. He'd have liked to be a bit further up the podium. The pace is certainly there. Just needs to work a little bit on that consistency. But that's always difficult to achieve on such changeable road conditions. There was a fascinating battle going on for 18th place going into the final run between Lizzie Jones and Jasmine Philpott. Well, Lizzie looks as though she's going to hang on to that position and she will take home the unofficial title of top lady racer this weekend, but by only nine seconds at the end of the run, final run of the weekend. Lizzie did well to hang on to that position. She and Jasmine in separate classes, but a private little battle going on between the two of them. Jasmine Philpott in particular impressing in the second half of the day, really improving her times towards the end of this opening round of the championship. And those two look set to continue that private battle throughout the rest of the year. So at the end of a full on day of action, Stephen Hiat takes the victory from Kevin Stubbs in second, whilst Jason Rowlands is third. He wins in class five as well. Rod Parker wins in class eight. He's also inside the top 10 overall. Whilst outside the top 10, Scott Benwell took the victory in class six. Jason and Harry Nickel won in class seven, whilst Lewis Simon held on to the class four victory. And finally, Philippa and James Tennant win in class one, whilst Chris Brennan, by virtue of being the only remaining finisher in class two, takes the class victory as well. Well, sadly, that brings an end to the season opener here at Walters Arena for the all-wheel drive club Ravenel and Brits Pass Ferry competition. One man who didn't make it past the first run is Richard. Um, you're only one ten, fantastic looking machine. Um, obviously, cheese is in your blood. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, how did it go from your point of view? It's been a fantastic day, obviously. You know, to see the competitors out here finally after that long winter break, they were all you know vying for it. They've done really good. A lot of attrition. Walters takes does has no. It doesn't take any prisoners. It, <laughs> it, it, it kills you dead. It's wonderful. Yeah, we had a bit of an issue. Uh, done a lot of work on it, but hey, we'll come bouncing back. I've got to get out there again, get production class back under the belt again. But I thank everybody, Brit Park, Ravenel, Par Homes, all our sponsors that come on board for this event and the rest of the season, and you guys for filming and taking this weather with you. You know, <laughs> Thank you very much for everything you've done as well. Oh, well thank you very much. Um, it, it has been a, a day of four seasons, hasn't it? We've had everything, wind, rain, sleet, snow, even sunshine now. It couldn't have had anything. You know, it, It's Walters, it's what it is, you know. Come October when we have our race up here, we're going to have bright, brilliant sunshine. But this time of year, it, it doesn't matter. Everybody's enjoyed it. It's been interesting seeing them all. And every, it really has been a good club event.